Now it's important to note that in the first century, men and women would normally be separated in the synagogue. So Rachel and Rami couldn't sit together. One had to be on the other side, separated. In some cases, the women were in a gallery, separated. Too much distraction. So this kind of exchange was really um, unusual and kind of forbidden. It's also important to note that women could not really participate in uh, the synagogue. This was uh, a place reserved for them. And so it's fair to say that the women in this context were to be seen and not heard. So you can see that this is not going to go very well. Jesus saw this woman who should be invisible and preparated. And he called out to her. In verse 12, he says, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. Wow, really? Just like that? Jesus pronounced healing. Freedom from her ailment. Freedom from an 18-year sentence that left her body and her mind broken, and that's which centered her to the far margins of her, of her society, bent over and unable to stand up straight. After 18 long years of suffering, shame, and exclusion, this beloved daughter of Abraham was able to stand up straight and she began to praise God. She began to praise God like nobody was watching. Jesus moved into the life of this woman, healed her, and released her from a spirit that had crippled her to one that was filled with praise and gratitude for the wonderful things God had done in her life. We know that this behavior and the scene that was created stirred up some big problems in the synagogue. We know that the leadership didn't like what they saw. And so they did what they needed to do. They pointed to the rule, rule number four. The text says the leader of the establishment was indignant. I had to look that word up. <laughs> it means that they were outraged. They were mad. They were bent out of shape. Because they interpreted that behavior as an offense, as a violation of the law of the Sabbath, which was a central feature of Jewish religious life. And of course, which carries it was a death sentence. Jesus responded. Jesus says, anybody know what Jesus said to them? You hypocrites. He spoke bold and brazen truth to the powerful. The very same group of people that he had warned his disciples in a number of chapters before, be alert to the yeast of the Pharisees, their hypocrisy. He wasn't talking about bread. He was talking about this hypocrisy. He condemned their hypocrisy directly and swiftly. Just as swift as he freed the woman from her 18-year sentence and gave her, gave her a new life. And in so doing, what did Jesus do? Jesus reinterpreted the law for those who were vexed by the healing. The same group of people whose job it was to interpret the law. Jesus, an outsider, came into the church and reinterpreted their law that they're supposed to uphold. Because Jesus knew that the Sabbath was made for humankind and not humankind for the Sabbath. 
that every day is appointed to carry out the works of God to meet the needs of God's people wherever the need is, even in church. Amen? Jesus was the fulfillment of the law at work, the law in action. The law in action to liberate, the law in action to heal, and the law in action to restore. Jesus was simply doing the liberating work of God. He was simply doing what he said he was sent to do. To proclaim release to captive, those who have bent over and broken, to let the oppressed go free from illness or whatever oppression looked like at the time, and to make those blind to injustice and the needs of the oppressed see their privilege and see their ignorance and hypocrisy. He was simply doing what he was anointed and set to do. Today, the people we call St. Hilary, we need Jesus on the move and at work to liberate a nobody. To raise up this head over woman so that she feels like a somebody. We know what happened to this head over woman. That she responded with praise in a place and a culture that rendered her invisible and rendered her silent. She began to praise God like nobody was watching. She forgot what side she was supposed to be on. This woman just went crazy, praising God, hands held up high. She just totally forgot about her position. This Jesus is here with us today. Amen? This Jesus is on the way to raise us up. Those of us who know what it feels like to be crooked and bent out of shape. And I believe that you're here this morning. Those who are bent out of shape by a serious illness. I've heard the stories. Those who have been bent and broken out of shape by injustice. And you know what injustice looks like. Underemployment, unemployment, you know the list. I have good news. There is good news in this passage. That this Jesus who approached this woman, who's bent over, invisible, and silent, and who set her free from her ailment, this Jesus is present with us today. This Jesus has also set us free. Those who are bent over and broken, those who are on the margin, and those who have been rendered silent. This Jesus is present with us today. Amen? Amen? And this Jesus comes to remind us that no weapon formed against us shall prosper in Jesus' name. Amen. Today we meet Jesus on the move to liberate from hypocrites. Amen? Amen. Jesus not only came to liberate the excluded, he also came to liberate those who have privilege and power and the powerful yesterday and today. He invited them as he's invited us to see things differently. That rules must serve to liberate, not deny and denigrate. Amen? Amen. Rules are made to liberate, not deny and denigrate. And so this passage comes to remind us to look closer at our rules, our traditions, our practices. If they exclude, if they separate, if they create unnecessary hierarchy and loops and loops to go through, who create inside or outsider, Jesus wants to enter in, to move in and to show us another way, the way of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Today we meet a Jesus whose movement created a, a response. When Jesus moved into the, into the synagogue, there was lots of reaction. There was praise, there was shame, there was rejoicing. I think in the New International Version it said, there was delight and humiliation in the same place. Because Jesus on the move means that things will be stirred up. Things will be stirred up. When God is on the move, moving people, things 
will be stirred up. They will be turned upside down, but I'd rather say right side up. And when God is on the move, what happens is that folks are propelled or motivated to be a witness, to tell somebody about the wonderful thing God has done in their life. That's what this woman did. She was just motivated to praise God for what God, was, God had done in her life. The crowd that was watching rejoiced. The key is that they responded to the movement of God in their lives and in their midst. And we as believers as 20 in the 21st century are called to do likewise, to witness to Jesus in our lives. This morning, the same Jesus who saw, invited, and touched this bent over woman is here with us today. This Jesus is at work seeing because it is hard to see. Seeing is not easy. This woman must have been coming to that synagogue for 18 years. Nobody saw her until this day. But Jesus is at work seeing and inviting and pronouncing blessing into our lives and freeing us from all that holds us captive and bent over. Amen? Amen. Amen. The same Jesus is at work at St. Stephen's Church. Last week we met Reverend Sky and the Out of Bound Grief Support Team. Reverend Sky and our team provide grief support <coughs> for communities who are affected by gun violence. And wherever gunshots are fired in our community, Reverend Sky and our team of grief support will just show up. No question harassed, and they comfort, the grieving, they help make preparation for funeral. They fundraise for funeral hope and scholarship. They are on the move offering Jesus to those they need. And we are called to do likewise. At St. Stephen's, I have been privileged to see and to hear how Jesus has moved and continues to move in the lives of believers. And so today, I'm going to venture out. I'm going to venture out, and I'm going to walk around. So be on guard. <laughs> I'm going to walk around. I'm going to invite, particularly the women, the ones who know what it means like to be bent over and bruised from life, to share something about one thing that God has done in their life. The Anglican Church, apparently, uh, research has been done that we score low on vibrant spirituality. And what that means is that we're a little bit silent about our faith. We're not, we're not so big on sharing. We're, we're, we're shy. <coughs> but I have told them not at St. Stephen's. Mm -hmm. This is not the case at St. Stephen's. And so today, the light is filming. <laughs> the evidence will be going out that we are a community who definitely do not have what the other churches have. We are, our spirituality is vibrant and it's alive and we are ready and willing to bear witness and to share something about what God has done in your life. How God has moved in your life. One particular, one example. I'm going to get the mic and I'm going to walk around like, Oprah, Oprah. Wow. And so, Jesus who? Of this bent over crooked woman, and she stood up and she praised God for all the wonderful things God has done in her life. So, one minute testimony, one minute. I'm coming down here because I'm coming to the elders so that we can lead the way. Sister Rita.
what a big, wonderful thing God has done in her, in Sister Rita's life. It's just being a witness. Last night at our social, she invited someone she met in the mall and her granddaughter to St. Stephen's. Because this is a place that has welcomed her, has upheld her, and has strengthened her faith. She's been coming here for 25 years, more than that. And so we had a wonderful time sharing last night, and she could not shut up. So I said, would you mind sharing that? And she said, yes. But today she's had Kofi, but I have the story. So thank you very much for, for sharing the story. Okay, who else? To bear witness to the wonderful things God has done in your life. Anybody else want to share a story? Any mentor or woman here want to share a story? Amen. Thank you very much. Saved. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord.
35 years of not ever seeing him. In 2011, by the miracle of Facebook, I tracked him down and we met. Praise the Lord. And I remember talking about him here. And I just want, every day, I thank God for having found him, having known him. He unfortunately died tragically three years later. But I thank God each and every day for bringing him back into my life, for the time that we spent together, and for, you know, getting to know this person who was a part of me. So, um, aside from all the things that God does for me on a regular basis, the things he does, you know, bringing me here with my family and so on, I thank God immensely every day for having known um, very um, sent his name. Yeah. And so, believers and listeners, go do likewise. Go do as Luke commands. To go and be a witness to the good things, the wonderful things that it's doing in your life. Amen. Thanks be to God.